you have your Bibles, turn into Mark chapter 6, verse 11, and then we'll go to Genesis 3 and 14. Be honest with you, I really don't know how this is going to work out because this is one of those harebrained things Brother, Cro Brother Crow comes up with. Yeah, it's just, you know, I don't know about you, but every now and then, my wife made a meal the other night. There's no, really no name for it. It was, it, it was just a conglomerate of, y'all may not know Southern food, but Zatarain's, anyone know Zatarain's is? Y'all like my red beans and rice, you know, that kind of stuff. So I'm, I'm down with that. But she threw a bunch of stuff together. And it was all right. I, I like it when someone will step out and do something. If you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you always got. Problem with some of us, you are too comfortable with that. And you still, service after service, have to be shaken. Mark 6 and 11, whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear you when ye depart then shake off the dust under your feet for a testimony against them. That's scary. That's serious. Jesus is talking here. You get to the point, you get fed up, you get tired of telling people the same thing over and over again. And you're not trying to be a problem. You're trying to help them get to the next level. Why, why, why do you want to make it difficult? You know? He's getting serious here. Verily I send you, it shall be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day judgment for that city. Y'all need to hear that. How, many, how long you got to be preached to about prayer and living for God and doing the work of God and serving God for years and you still have to get shaken weekly just to put in the minimal effort? Genesis 3 and 14. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field, and upon thy belly shalt thou go, and the dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. Of thy life. You know what he just said? The devil's in the dust. You know what Jesus said? Shake off the dust. I'm going somewhere. I'm going to step in your living room. I'm going to step on your feet. But it's not really me. It's the word. And I hope someone, if I just get one family, if I get one person, if I get one dad, if I get one head of household to finally get the concern of all your children following you and living for God. If I can get a wife to start following a husband. Man, I can't imagine what kind of couple Ananias and Sapphira would have been if just one of them said, no, we're going to live for God. I can't imagine what kind of King Ahab would have been if his wife would have just got. Let's lay our Bibles down and let's go to the Lord. Jesus, we need you. We need your help. We live in a world that's in turmoil. There is so much clutter. There is so much turmoil and dirt. We need help, Lord, to clean out our own closets, to clean out our own homes and our lives, God. We want to walk with you and talk with you. We don't want those just to be words. We want it to be a lifestyle. Lord, help me tonight as I preach to your beloved saints of God here and those following online. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. God bless you. You can be seated. I want to speak for just a few minutes on the devil and the dusty road. Last couple of weeks, we have tried to refrain, except for a few people, to come to the house because we're living out of boxes. And then you add insult to injury and because of a leak and some problems with uh, other things, I've had to cut sheetrock. And I don't know if anybody knows what sheetrock is, but you can't fool with sheetrock without creating dust. <laughs> and until you're done getting that sheetrock done, I don't care how much you dust. <laughs> All that being said, imagine walking into somebody's house and being completely impressed with the tidiness and the lack of clutter 
in the home. I mean, nobody likes clutter, and if you like to walk in a house, that fails some basic standards of tidiness and cleanliness. In fact, there's just something about a tidy, uncluttered room or house that lends toward a sense of order. But let's be real. Let's be honest. There are a lot of homes that are tidy. There are a lot of homes that are organized, free from clutter. Everything has its place, and they pride themselves with the organizational skills. Yet, there is that looming oversight that is often neglected by so many. Dust. That dreadful, ever-present, pesky particle that invades every one of our homes. And so while dust is a collection of varied particles, an overwhelming amount of dust is literally two-thirds from outside your home. I get that we create some of our own dust, but a lot of dust is from the outside coming in to dirty your home. Dirt from <coughs> shoes and airborne particle particles and pollen and pollution and skin is often actually sucked in and filtered throughout your HVAC system and dispersed throughout your house. This is a daily problem that wages war against the most diligent of organizers and cleaners. This is where I chuckle, considering how tidy so many pride themselves in how their homes appear. Because it's even those who claim, whose claim to fame is a organized, tidy, comfortable confines of their la casa. If you take a quick look around, you'll find out who deals with the dust and who does not. Because dust is not a weekend issue, it's a daily issue. See, you're getting caught up in the dust, and I'm not speaking about dust per se, but I'm talking about spirituality. Dust is a daily issue. Dust can gather anywhere and everywhere. It settles on our bookshelves, on our counters. It settles everywhere. So for the clean freak, it is the bane, it is the anathema, the adversary, an antagonist to the clean culture of a meticulously kept house. I found out myself that you can clean and tidy and organize and vacuum and dust and put everything away, and within minutes, you can see dust somewhere. And so for that somewhat clean person, tidies, cleans and declutters and prepares for that visit, that friend, that family, the company. It is a, a sense of embarrassment when the oversight to wipe down a place where dust has found itself is discovered by that visitor. So this strengthens my point that tidy doesn't mean clean. Organized doesn't mean Immaculate. You could have an organized, well-placed life that really doesn't mean it's clean. So what does dust have to do with a carnal home? I'm glad you asked. Spiritually, a carnal home is a dusty home. Let's face it, a lot of people live for God under the pretense of how much can I allow into my life without it affecting my spirituality? I got one that wants to be honest. It doesn't typically begin that way, but over time, the enticement of the ease of entertainment and hobbies and various pleasures eats away at the hard spiritual skeleton of our spiritual frame. We become more flexible, more tolerant, more willing, more lenient in what we allow. And in the words that have escaped the lips of so many, we embrace the ideology that is captured in relax. 
Don't be so rigid. You're being judgmental and legalistic. It's okay. We're not at church today. I mean, seriously. If we live the way some people want us to live, we won't have any fun at all, right? And maybe the words have been slightly different, but I believe if you're honest, you get my point. That reasoning happens almost every single day, and it is the reason that even the most tidy, organized-looking, stately saints are carnal. You're okay with not being spiritual because you're very much okay with your carnality. Now, I think it's important to clarify that carnality is not necessarily sinful. And this is why it escapes. And this is why some people have never achieved the things in God that they viewed but never accomplished. As you heard me correctly, and I did touch on it this past week, carnality is not necessarily sinful. Dangerous, yes. But sinful, not always. You see, carnality is captured or revealed best by behaviors, mindsets, opinions, and activities that fail to promote and build the spiritual man. Do I need to say that again? Because our spirituality is like a plant that needs a certain environment to thrive. There are some of us, you're great with the garden and you're great with the house and you're great with all these things and everything that your hand seems to touch prospers. But you've never released your hands into your life into God's hands. And why is it that God can't grow in you? It's not sin. It's your carnality. That being said, we can then ascertain carnality definitely destroys the environment and our spirituality suffers. Isaiah 5, 1 through 4 says, Now I will sing to my beloved a song of my beloved touching his vineyard. Hands on the vineyard. My well-beloved hath a vineyard in a very fruitful hill. And he fenced it and gathered out the stones thereof and planted it with the choicest vine and built a tower in the midst of it and also made a wine press therein. And he looked that it should bring forth grapes. Can I just reverse our thinking? Instead of asking God to do something for you, how many of you can say, God's already done so much for me? God has already done for me that Isaiah is talking about here. Man, he's, he's, he, he set me up. He's pulled me out. He pulled me out of miry clay. He's done everything possible for me. Why is it that we look for what God's going to do today instead of looking at our lives and saying, what can I do for God? What can I do to be that fruitful? What about my part to make myself fruitful? But it's the carnality that destroys the effort that God puts into us. Because it's not the sin, it's the carnality. I said, I believe God, but today I believe in me. I believe God, but today I want to do what I want to do. He goes on and he looked that it should bring forth grapes, but it brought forth wild grapes. That's not what I wanted from you. Mm -hmm. All now all inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah judge. I pray you betwixt me and my vineyard. What could have been done more to my vineyard? What could have been done more for us or in us that I have not done in it? Wherefore, when I looked that it should bring forth grapes, brought it forth wild grapes. You may survey your life and think you've done well, but have you done or allow God to do through you so that he can look and say, that's awesome. God has done so much for every one of us, and I can testify that woe is me if I don't do the things of God. I, I am so undeserving of all that he's done for me. Should we not also take account responsibility for the things that are counterintuitive? 
that we bring or allow in our lives? Am I not responsible for the things that I bring into my life that stop me and hinder me from being spiritual? We blow it off as carnal. We blow it off as this boy's toys. And we blow it off as they're just being girls. And we blow it off. It's just, it's just that. Wait a minute. Aren't we not mandated to show, therefore, the fruit of the hand of God in our lives? Many of us clean house to try to sweep the dust under the rug. And it's an issue. A lot of things that we allow in our homes are very dangerous because most are very protective of our influences in our young children. And that's important. But can you poison a full-grown tree and it still be okay? Why do we put so much care in our children and neglect ourselves? Why would we neglect the same concern over our desperately important spiritual life. If, if you're not spiritual, you're carnal. To be carnal is to be fleshly minded. If you find yourself quoting more your colloquialisms and opinions than the word of God, that's a sign of carnality. Can we be honest? If you can't wait to get out of here and go do something for you and for your flesh and for yourself, can we be honest? I mean, there are things that we have to do. But how much stuff do we have involved in our life that we don't have to do, and then we turn around and wonder, what's God doing? Nobody would tolerate, and nobody likes to tolerate physical laziness because it's a carnal behavior. In fact, one of the biggest things being a pastor around the church is hearing other people complain how other people do things. Trust me, that's the side of pastoring I can do less with. It blows my mind the amount of stuff that I hear, and I have to tell people, hey, I'm just glad I'm not doing this by myself. Some people, well, I do it a whole lot better by myself, but how much can you get done by yourself? Definitely not going to build a church by yourself. You ain't going to raise a family by yourself. That's why God's planned it to be a man and a woman. It's a family unit. While it may not be the benchmark of sin, a lot of carnality is contrary to the activities and disciplines that promote the development of our spiritual man. At the heart of laziness, spiritual laziness, is an undisciplined life and mind, and nothing is more detrimental long-term to the success of one's spiritual walk with God than an undisciplined life and the ability to say no for the sake of doing for God what you've been really called to do. And sadly, we have invested all our time in the church with preaching points that address the big sins while we neglect the very things that cause spiritual stagnation. If you look around a room to wait to see what's going on, you're probably so carnal, you're not spiritual enough to be in tune with God with what he's doing. A spiritual disruption in intimacy is caused by carnality and an undisciplined lifestyle. In other words, I would say that our churches have more carnal saints than we have sinful saints. I'm not here to preach about sin. I'm here to preach about carnality. If you're married to a spouse that has a proclivity to drink, you're always going to be constantly worried about where he's at. And every bar you drive by, you'll be looking for their car. How can you be focused on the things you should do when you're so busy doing the things you shouldn't? Now, that's a drastic way to put it. But how can you turn around and say, I want the church to grow, but the only time you hear is because you want to punch a time clock. Thank God. And, and I thank God for the, uh, the cameras, and I probably shouldn't say this. But thank God for those people that come by and pray on their own. Thank God for those people that show up. And Man, I am thank God for all the work going around here. We had a work day. We'll probably dust this Saturday. But I'm going to be honest with you. All that can go to pot if we don't get really spiritual, if we're not really the truth. I don't care how manicured the grass is if we're dead in here. Let me say that again. We have more carnal saints than sinful saints. My house is clean. Look at me. My house is never cluttered. 
I always pick it up, says someone else. My house is organized, always smell good. It's picked up and it's vacuumed, says another. But with a spiritual close examination of all the tidy, picked up, organized homes will reveal the pesky issue lying around in everyone's loud claim to clean. Dust! Dust! Oh, you got it great. You look fantastic from a distance. But when we get up and put a microscope on your life, there's carnality and dust that's engulfed your life that you don't care if you come to an altar. You don't care if you're praying through. You don't care. You stand back as a critical critic looking at how well you look, but you don't realize that dust has taken over your discipleship. Don't get me wrong. By all means, tidy up. Clean up your life. Put away the clutter. Organize every little bit of it. But before you settle down and think you've achieved some status where you don't need to do anything and settle down on your leaves, you better get the dust cloth out. You better get that cloth out and start sleeping no finer places in your life and find out that the carnality and where it snuck in before you settle down into stagnant satisfaction that reminds you, just like there's more to being a Christian and getting all cleaned up on a Sunday morning and putting on a nice outfit and attending church, we too have to address the carnality in our lives. And dust is easy to overlook. It's often neglected because, well, I'll dust next time. No one said that here, I know, we're good. You can look clean, you can look tidy, you can even look holy. You got everything in its place. You have order and organization. But let me just remind those and tell those who think they've got a corner on clean, no one escapes the onslaught of dust. Everyone needs that place of prayer. Everyone needs an altar. Everyone needs their Bible. Everyone needs the church. Everyone needs a pastor to get up and preach this subject every now and then. Every one of us needs to realize, wait a minute before I settle on my lees and think I've got everything scared for you. Boy, I better look around because God isn't looking at the sin in my life. He's too busy, blinded by the dust in his eyes. The house can look fantastic. Your temple can look absolutely amazing, and we're all impressed. But how's your spiritual life? You got the right clothes. You got the right shoes. You got the right, you got the image that you want. But the dust that's invaded and the dirt that's invaded in your heart, and the carnality that consumes you on a daily basis because you won't allow a dust cloth of the word of God and the preaching to get in and go, yeah. He's been shaking me to pray for one hour. He's been shaking me for years to pray for one hour. I still mosey on in 10 minutes after prayer thinking it's all good because I got my house clean. I got everything tidy. I looked the part. Everybody thinks of I got the title that says I'm a part, but dust has invaded and you're polluted. First Corinthians tells us in 6, 19 and 20, what? What? And we say, turn your hand and say, what? No, no, no. You got to say it like they, they, like they just said something absolutely ridiculous. What? Husbands and wives, you know what I'm talking about. Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own? Some, some people can't make it past that part right there. For ye are bought with a price, therefore, therefore, glorify God in your body. That's funny how you think everything's for you. You know what? Somebody find this page in your Bible. Rip that out. Because that one's tough to live. That one's like, excuse That's one of those spanking scriptures. You're getting a good paddle on that one. Glorified with my life? What do you mean? Oh, wait a minute now. That's going to affect what I do. Oh. But why? You figured it out. 
Glorify God with your life. It's funny how much glory we want. Our name, our image, and our house, and our tidiness, and our cleanliness, and our organization. Well, everybody should do stuff like me. You should wear clothes like I do, and listen to what I do, and act like I do. Oh, God. And I hear, I hear people all the time tell me, oh, so-and-so. And I look to my God. I tell, you, I tell you what, and I've seen this before. My first pastor, I had a guy telling me, I can't know why they're worshiping God. His claim to fame with every, he had all the money he needed. He was organized, had it all together. God never came to an altar. Gave me more trouble than anybody else just by his attitude. And I had people that were broke and busted and hurt, running the aisles and shouting and jumping and growing spiritually. Be careful that you don't think that your organization and that your achievements have replaced your need to dust. Just because you've achieved something doesn't mean your carnality gets a pass. Oh, it's the carnality that's destroyed some of the greatest preachers we've ever had. It's carnality that's destroyed marriage. I don't need to tend to that. Everything looks good. We are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your... Well, someone better get in there and get a black pen and mark that one out because you don't think you need to be spiritual which are God's. Can I ask the question of you? When I buy something, I usually don't take it to my house. Anybody else do the same? How many has filled our house with stuff? Go move. Go move. Go move. Just, I don't care. Just move. And you're going to realize, oh, You'll question your entire existence like, really? Well, I sure like to get the money back on all this stuff that I thought was so important. And we fill our house. Let me ask, this is the last time Jesus filled your home. When's the last time he was the invited guest that can fill your home? How many wouldn't dust knowing Jesus was showing up? This is important to understand because we often make the mistake of determining the cleanliness of our home by the lack of clutter and overall appearance of tidiness. Now listen, don't get me wrong. I like a good picked up home, free of clutter, free of dirty dishes, dirty floors, and definitely any unwanted smells. But you still can't call a home that's lacking all those things that's full of dust a clean home. Dust may be a small thing, but it leads to big problems. Romans 8, 7 and 8 tells us, For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to the God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Romans 12 and 2, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God what is good and acceptable and perfect. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 17. But understand this, that in the last days there will become times of difficulty for people to be lovers of self. This is dust, folks. This is dust. Lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasures rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power. Don't tell me and don't come in here with a title. Come in here. Let me see you pray through. Get the Holy Ghost speaking of the tongue. Pray some of them. Win us all. Dust out your house and get back to the things of God. Don't disregard the dust. The devil's in the dust. The devil's in the dust. Let me tell you something. Dust is known for its undeniable potential to cause respiratory, cardiovascular health problems and immuno problems. Dust also, it can irritate the eyes, throat, and skin. Causes a multitude of other problems, spiritual problems, growth deficiency. May, may, uh, you see, your carnality is that dust that stops you from growing properly. It stops you from breathing properly and living properly. Oh, you may not have sin, 
but you've never got to that place of spiritual maturity because you got comfortable with tidy. And you become irritable and sickly because of the carnality or dust. Dust includes tiny particles of debris, pollution, dead skin, and at small signs, Size means it can be inhaled and potentially cause an immune reaction. Dust can also serve as a vehicle potentially carrying viruses, poisons, and causing, passing on infections. Now, y'all know me, and we're fixing to get to something I've had to deal with personally, and it blew my mind. Are you ready? The other day, uh, I just, I, I did my part with the house. You know, Sister Crystal, I, I've done everything. I've been a good husband, and I've done everything. I told Jonathan, I did. I did. Okay, I, I did. I, I've been doing everything I've been told to do. And then the other day, she turned around, you need to get a mattress set. And I'm like, I thought you was doing that. And no, I want you to take care of it. Well, you don't understand that entails things for me. I just don't run down to the nearest store and go, can I have a mattress, please? I research, brother. I, I, but Terry, I, I, know, I know it's just a mattress. And to us guys, we just need a comfortable place to lay with clean seats and we'll get up and go to, we, and, and go ahead and put your pillows and all that other stuff that gets it. Fine. I'll get the mattresses. So I started doing research and as I started doing research, I found out something. There are people all over the country in the United States since 2006, that six, that kind of went 2006 that are getting sick because of a mandated law that they passed. The U.S. Consumer Production Safety Commission, the CPSC, something new, approved a 2006 federal regulation, 16 CFR 1640, enforcing a strict national flame-proof mattress standard mandating all new mattresses to withstand a two-foot-wide blowtorch. Or 70 seconds. Where are you going with this, Pastor? Stay with me. So now, I almost want to cut this because there are lawsuits everywhere over this. We are being exposed to harmful chemicals, dusts, and powders. God forgive me. Because a few, whatever words you know that I would put there, want to smoke in bed or can't stop lighting their mattress on fire. Now, I don't know about you, but I've never taken a blowtorch to bed. <laughs> I don't know why my mattress would have to withstand a blowtorch. But nevertheless, somebody in the government, I've done some research, Basically, they're saying chemical companies wanted another way to make money. So they mandated our bed, says, to be fireproof. It sounds good. It sounds right. It's, yeah, I don't want to my captain on fire. But you have to understand what it takes to make something fireproof. The devil's in the dust, folks. I can't even say some of these words, so I'm not speaking in tongues. I'm reading chemicals to you. Polybrominated definyl ethers, PBDEs. Once these particles, and they are particles, make their way into the body, they never go away. These toxic chemicals can stay in your tissues and build up for a lifetime, causing various detrimental health effects. You know, you know what the other is? Boric acid. That just kind of sounds like a cleaner to me, but it's not. It is literally the chemical they use to kill roaches. Now, I don't know about you, but it's hard to kill a roach. In fact, between roaches and crows, they're going to be the animals that survive the apocalypse. That's just the way things are. Them and maybe hyenas. Long-term exposure to boric acid, which is, listen, understand, and every, I won't say this again, but everything else, if you spill your drink in your bed, or if you have a child that wets the bed, no, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not like pointing to you guys, or do I need to? Okay, so when we wet the bed over here, hey, we all get older and go back in diapers, so hey. 
it causes, it literally causes those chemicals to come to the surface. Go read about your mattress and go read about something. They tell you, don't take that cover off. Go read, go, go look at it. Especially if you've got a new one, it says 2006. It leads, blunt leads to cardiovascular defects, kidney lesions, impaired fertility. And here's another one, antimony trioxide. This it's death powder, okay? Just call it that. That's to simplify everything instead of saying, now this is, I'm not speaking in tongues. Deca bromdifenyl oxide. Tumors. Thyroid. Developmental and neurological effects. This one here, I've heard of it before. Melamine. Most guys, you know, we kind of know what that is, we think. But extended exposure messes with the central nervous system. Causes convulsions, spasms. Yeah. It is actually the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health has also declared a potential carcinogen. Now, if that word is familiar to you, it is also the chemical that China, <clears throat> an Asian country, was sending our pet food over here that was killing all those pets years ago. I'm going to stay away from that because I could really get off on that. And I'm not going to do it. It damages the human cell. Bladder problems, bladder cancer to be exact. Vinylidene chloride. It's a declared a, a, a carcinogen. All these are particles. I, I, I don't know if I made Erica listen to it or not, but I... I, I, I Listen to the thing on this. When you first, how many have ever gotten the mattress before you had to take it out of the plastic? Anybody? I've done it. They literally tell you to take it and put it in the garage for at least eight weeks before you bring it in your home. Or call the company you bought it from, tell them to uh, wrap it up in plastic and leave it exposed to the open air for at least six to eight weeks to let the amount of outgassing to go down. Now, I know about outgassing. I understand that. I worked for Intel, which makes uh, uh, the computer chips that make sure those phones and computers run so well. Now, I worked in the clean room. The clean room was where those guys dress up in those white suits. They kind of look like, you know, you're dealing with a plague or something like that, and you're working, and you're completely masked off so no particle outgas can come from you. Now, you're going to think this is crazy, but they didn't even allow... There was only one kind of ballpoint pen and one kind of paper allowed in there because one particle, what, and you know pens outgas? They outgas. They literally expel. Now, we don't even think on this structure in this molecular level, but they do, and it causes problems. And when you have a, a disc or a wafer, it's called, with, you know, so many chips on there, you get a particle on there, each wafer is a million dollars. Are you willing to let a particle get there and throw away a million dollars? That's just your mattress in your home. They tell you when you get a toaster, turn it on and leave it for a while, let it cook, and let it cook all the plastics and the stuff off. You ever put a brand new toaster on and you get that smell? It's toxic. I could go down. How about the new microwaves? And I started doing this research. I thought, man, we're all going to die. But let me get back to my point. They say the devil's in the details. I don't know about that, but I know he's in the dust. I know he's in our carnality. He's okay with that carnality. You think it's just a proclivity. You think it's just a hobby. You think it's just a habit. But basically all the deadly particles that are found in dust spiritually are the same things to our spirituality. You don't, you're, you're not able to reproduce. Every one of those chemicals cause reproduction problems. Let me tell you, spiritual dust cause reproduction problems. Oh, I just said a mouthful for the church. If you're a saint of God, if you love souls and you've been bought with a price, that ought to tell you something. Some carnality, I got to get rid of it. I've become you know, unable to duplicate and replicate and cause the birth of more people. Why? I'm not born bearing people into the church. They're not being born. Why? Because the particles of dust have ruled you. Enable. I want to win somebody. No, you don't. You want more of this and you want more of that. And, you want, and your carnality keeps you from being able to reproduce. 
I know dust can irritate the eyes, the nose, the throat. I know that dust can cause and promote and exasperate allergies. And I know dust can affect the lungs and overall health. And dust is a breeding ground for dust mites. And you don't think dust is a problem, but did you know that a home that seldom dust can accumulate on the average in one year 40 pounds of dust? And then if you have carpets, all bets are off. 40 pounds a year is average, but we live in Arizona, and all bets are off for the dusty climate here. You get the picture. Well, guess what? That's what a carnal home looks like. It can be tidy. It can be put up and look like everything's clean. And it may not have any spiritual stains on the carpet. There's no sinful clutter that trips and opposes those who live in the home, but it has a lot of dust, and it's rendered you unproductive. Unbeknownst to the carnal person, the dust builds, and the quality of spiritual life is diminished. Galatians 5 and 17 is for the flesh lusted against the spirit. It may not be sin, but it's fighting the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other so that you cannot do the things that you, you want to know why you weep and cry because you can't do this or you didn't accomplish that in God. Because well, yeah, you let carnality rule the day. You allowed yourself to look the part without dusting the house. Carnality is a pollutant that settles like layers of dust upon the shelves the furniture, the belongings that are nicely organized in your temple that's supposed to belong to the Holy Ghost. We get comfortable with our dust because instead of pointing up close to things, we point to our tidy, organized homes and are satisfied with that and don't desire to do the efforts required for, and I think it was poetically amazing that Brother Bruce used the word deep clean for Saturday. It's too hard to get up on that shelf. It's too high to clean the dust off that pan. Oh, it's too much. It, nobody sees the top of the refrigerator. It's time consuming to daily invest in the efforts of gathering and cleaning up all the new dust that quickly settles from the outside world in our lives. And so we begin to tolerate it. We begin to allow it. We begin to accept it. Hey, I look tidy. I look I clean the house. I, you really don't expect me to dust too. And so we have all the appearance of clean, but dust begins to settle. Don't neglect the dust, church. Or let me say it this way. Don't neglect the dust, disciple, or a disciple will not neglect the dust. Are you hearing me? Mm -hmm. We all know the dreadful world outside our home seems to find its way in. Comforts such as air conditioners bring in a steady stream of dust every day. Summertime, especially the Arizona dry landscapes cause dust to get trapped in on the bottom of shoes. Have you looked closely at your air filter after you change it every Because that dust is in your home. It's astonishing what's collected in a short amount of time. That being said, when was the last time you took a good look at the behaviors, the habits, and the activities you've been allowing in your home? The collected dust that keeps you from being that standout disciple. If we ever lived in a time when we need disciples that can turn the world upside down, we have Christians that are carnal and okay with being in the world. What you watch, what you read, what you listen to, what you occupy your time with. Sure, you may be able to argue against it being sinful, but are they carnal? You may be able to argue, but 2 Corinthians makes an amazing statement in 10 4, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Do perpetual carnal strongholds exist in your life and home because you don't want to dust? 
That's not a sin. I don't have to get that out of my life. What does the Lord say? Could you not pray one hour? Is it, a, is it a sin not to pray an hour? But it was carnal not to. Is it a sin to be late for prayer? Is it a sin to not read your Bible? I mean, are you here I'm going? I'm trying to let you do some thinking on your own here and not just pastor. Are you really willing to risk the dust and hope that it doesn't have an impact on the lives of your family? Maybe because you become lenient with the dust, your, your kids and your family now does things you never really wanted to do, but you just kind of decided not to dust. And are you really willing to allow dust to settle and hope that it doesn't affect your prayer life, your sensitivity to the Spirit? And your overall just spiritual disciplines. Does anybody here want to wave their hands up and down and say, I am exactly as spiritual and as powerful in things of God as I ever want to be? I can't do that. Come on. Come on. I, I'm, 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 trying, I'm looking for someone that wants to get real. Not look real, but be real. What separates the Elijahs from those other 50 sons of the prophets? What? What? What, what separated Enoch? What, what separated Noah in his chair? What separated Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Was it merely a determination to dust? Are, are, you, get, are you getting... Can, can, now I can say right now about Souls Harbor that this is an amazing church with amazing, loving people. This is... This is a wonderful church. There's no question about how what an awesome church family this is. I can honestly, and I do today, I tell anybody, ever, you got to meet the people in my church. This church that I go to over here, I tell them about this church. I say, we got the, we got loving people. We got great. I, I've, got, I've got no fear in my own family. Anybody I know walks in here and meets you. You are amazing people. You are loving people. This church is an amazing group of people that gather. We, I'm telling you what. There's no question that some of us have cleaned up pretty good. We've come a long way and the momentum is obvious. It's obvious that Soul Harbor Church is stepping or trying to step to another level that it's never been at before. We don't have a major sin problem here. We don't. But I tell you what we do have. We got a carnal problem. Some of you have been around here a little while. I'm going to point right at you. Well, point at me first. We got a carnal problem. Let's get real. Brother Lou, I'm looking at you. We're preachers. We're carnal. If we're going to lead, we got to dust. If you want to lead, you got to dust. If you want to lead, you better dust. Anybody feel better right now? Let's y'all point at me right now. Tell pastor to dust. Ain't gonna hurt my feelings. It ain't gonna bother me none. I ain't afraid of the word of God, what it tells me to do. I don't want to be lost. I better dust. You better dust. You better dust. You better dust. Let me tell you something, the devil loves nothing more than get a stronghold of dust in your life. If you're up here singing and preaching and you're walking around, and you're like, oh, you don't care about them other ones. He said, if I topple the big trees, I'll crush them little ones. You want to walk around here, you want to be something, you want to tell me, oh, I started this church, or I used to pastor this church, or I used to pastor, or this or that. And I'm going to get real right now and tell you, hey, I want to go to the next level. I want to go to, I want Souls Harbor to go there. I want you to go. I want your family. I, Terry, I want you to be able to stand up 10 years from now when they're 18 years old and they'll look at you and say, that boy ain't coming in near me, Dad. I want Brother John, I want you to be able to look at these girls. Like, you, don't, you don't have to worry about them. They, go, they ain't going to play that game. They're going to care. They're going to matter because there's going to be people walking around here, they dust. They just don't look the part. They're dusting the part. They're the real part. They're not going home and, and causing all the bunch of problems and disrupting their own home and disrupting their Ah, we're dusting because we want to be disciples. I know the devil's in the dust, and I'm going to dust this off, and I'm going to dust it. I'm going to find something else. I want to make sure we just don't look clean. We're getting clean. I like the 
that we got tidy chairs and everything's in order. But my God, we got to dust our spirits and our minds and our hearts. We got to turn around and be honest with our wives and our husbands. Hey, I ain't been dusting right. I ain't been doing right. We got to get real quick. Quit acting and just sweeping it under the rug. And you're tripping over your own pile of dust. Would you call a dusty car a clean car? No. <laughs> we all see it here in Arizona. You sit in your chair and the sun comes gleaming through the window. And it blows, I don't know about you, it blows my mind how much dust is floating in the air in my house. I'm like, how do I not feel like I'm getting pelted by bugs walking through? Are you hearing what I'm saying? What do we really see in our homes when the sun comes shining through? What do we really see when we allow Jesus to come walking into our house and, and it shows us the dust that's in our homes and how the carnality has invaded our life and everything in our culture has come moving in. We're like the man who visited the psychiatrist complaining, man, doc, I, I, man, I just can't stop misbehaving. My conscience is troubling me. I'm just tormented. The doctor said, so you want me to give you something to strengthen your willpower? He said, no, not really. Can you give me something to weaken my conscience? Oh, it's a sad day when we want to weaken our spiritual conscience. I don't want to be bothered by that. Bother me, Jesus. Bother me. Take me, wake me. Take me so that I could go from barely praying an hour to praying 10 hours and the whole glory of God coming down and moving that moves in my life and into my family and into my spouse and into my church. And it's undeniable that we're the people of God. Luke 9 and 5, and I'm bringing this to a close. Whosoever will not receive you when you go out of that city, shake off the dust from your very feet for a testimony against them. There's a difference between those that dust and don't dust. There's a difference. Why are you entertaining carnal content? Why are you entertaining the carnality into your life? Why have you become accustomed and comfortable with carnal thinking? Why are you content with entertainment that brings dust into your home? So, in all honesty, as I bring this to close in order to bring to a point, I want to offer the opportunity to expose the fact that we need to dust. And in dusting, it creates an opportunity to exceed, excel, and achieve greater things. In a sense, Maybe today we could find the Joshua or the Caleb today that we need. Maybe as we dust and as we dust our homes deep inside, there's someone here that will rise to the occasion for Souls Harbor because we need an Esther, we need a Gideon, we need a Ruth. Oh, we need people of God for this hour, those who hate the garment spotted by the flesh. I'm talking to someone today. Maybe, maybe, it's you. maybe you're sick and tired of the way it's always been and you're realizing that your pride has left you empty and you'd rather do something for the glory of God. You know, what are you talking I'm talking about Jude 1 and 23. And others saved with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating the garment, even spotted by the flesh. I'm looking for someone today who's willing to give that simple extra effort and willing to dust out the carnality. As we stand, I want to declare to someone it's time to dust. That command to dust off your feet appears four times. In each case, it's spoken by Jesus to his disciples when he sent them out about to you. You need to have your carnality is keeping you from being productive. I guarantee you, some of you, if you put away carnality, you'd sing, this, you'd sing like never before. You'd preach like never before. You'd witness like never before. You'd be amazing in the kingdom of God like never before with just a simple dusting. Because it's not that you're sinful, but you got comfortable with carnal. If any place will not welcome you or listen to you, leave that place and shake the dust off your feet. Shaking dust off of your feet conveys the same idea as our modern phrase, I wash my hands of it. It just comes a place where you've got to get sick and tired of the dust. There's no achievement in dust. There's no excelling, just it's excelling in the things of the spiritualness of the church while I'm full of the carnal dust of this world.
Oh, I get it. It makes sense. some of you look yeah, downward. Oh, they look successful. But how do I look to the great host? The great cloud of wind. Do I look anemic and dusty? Shaking off the dust is symbolic and, indi and an indication that one has done all that can be done in a situation and therefore carries no further responsibility for it. I, I'm not going to. Oh. He walked by and laid the mantle on his shoulder. Walked on. You know what he said? It's your responsibility to take care of your calling. It's your responsibility to dust. The whole premise behind it is to go and reach and preach and remain spiritual in a carnal world. The biggest hindrance to being amazing and anointed in the kingdom of God is simply carnality and not sin. Someone that's willingly sinning isn't looking to be anointed. So you have to ask yourself that the laborers are few. What's really keeping me? What's really keeping you from being that spiritual? It's not sin. It's carnality. You have to understand that even the dust of those cities that rejected the Lord was an abomination. The dust is an abomination. It's time to do some dust. And some embed in, in, embedded right here in this symbolic gesture of dusting was the implication that God also saw the dust shaking and would judge people accordingly. It's time to dust. That spiritual significance to a disciple of Jesus shaking the dust off the feet is, is, is a statement of finality about people who have been given the truth and reject it. At some point, you got to I've worked with them enough. I've preached to them. I've prayed for them. I've taught them Bible. At some point, you got to do your own dusting. You got to do your own dusting. I, I, I. We got to get to, I don't want the dust to remain on me of the world. When, I, when you step out of that world, when you step out of an old way, when you stepped out, I don't even want the dust on me. I don't, when they came out of the fire, they didn't even smell like smoke. Oh, somebody. Paul and Barnabas put this to practice in Acts 13. But the Jews stirred up the devout and honorable women and the chief men of the city and raised persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them out of their coast. But they shook off the dust of their feet. They've been preaching and teaching. But some of the leaders in the city stirred up persecution against them. So they shook off the dust of their feet, warning them. Are you hearing me? Our obedience is only hindered. Listen again. Our obedience is only hindered by our carnality. To go and say, well, it's not a sin is the lowest common denominator to serve Jesus. That's like saying, well, my marriage contract didn't say this. It just said that. Ooh. We are believers. But are we doers? Has our dusty carnal lives been hidden behind a tidy, organized religious ceremony of being here on Sunday and Wednesday? We attend church, but we're so busy with our carnality to be the church. It's a story told by Sinclair Lewis about a character by the name of Carol Kennicott that ended up in a small Minnesota town. My marriage and whatever good qualities it has, she soon discovered about its smallness and confinement. Over time, she got to know her of excellent lawyer whom she saw so much potential beyond what would ever get realized where he was. And she confronts him one day with the reality of him languishing in that place. And she wonders why he doesn't move to a, a place which is bigger and better and where his abilities and talents could be realized. The lawyer said, understands and knows the truth of her discovery about him, but he also knows the effort that it would take to do it, and he frankly admits to her that life is good enough. Mm. Good enough. 
that his pain doesn't compel him to leave and it's just easy to stay put. How many is to how many is that our story spiritually? We're too comfortable with our carnality. We don't have the resolve to improve and move forward, even when it might be on our own best interest to do so. Because life is good enough. And we get stuck where we are and we let the dust settle and remain in our organized, tidy, comfortable life. And so we sit back and hope someone else will rise up and deal with the dirt and the dust in our day. Every head bowed, eye closed. I got a question. Anybody here want the next level of spirituality? Is there any young people here that want to outdo us adults? Anybody here that you're tired of being stagnated spiritually? And you're tired of being stuck and dust is collected in your life and you know this tidying up the clutter ain't going to do anything it's time to remove the dust is there anybody here you have the freedom and you have the call to go into the next phase of spirituality and ministry and Jesus is looking for someone here to shake off the dust anybody here want to shake off the dust and listen and follow the Holy Spirit's direction tonight Anyone want to surrender to the Lord, remove the carnality and become more faithful to the mission of the greatest cause on this planet, the church?